Paul, welcome back to the show. Thanks. You've been uh, playing some more of Prey, I see, from your post. I have been. I'm actually, like, last week I said, oh, or, or sometime last week I started Prey, and then just today I started a second playthrough. I mean, you know, way back in 2017 I did like three or four playthroughs, but now, you know, I'm doing another group of playthroughs, and I'm on my second. Playthroughs for content. Boy, do I really like this game. I like it more now than I did back in 2017 when I made it my game of the year. Oh, wow. They've added some stuff. I, I didn't, like, I think in 2018 they did some patches or some DLC or whatever, and I didn't really go back to the game. But since my initial playthrough, they've added um, sort of more challenging stuff. You can get burned, your character can get burned, broken bones, concussion, radiation poisoning. And these are things you can't fix with med kits. Like these are additional and they all have like these bad things they do to you. So as you're scrambling right. around this, this space station, um, you've got these additional injuries you've got to think about and deal with. And that makes it so much more interesting. I really like that. I appreciate that. So I've been doing a, a, I did a super playthrough on story mode um, playthrough just to get all the footage I need. And now I'm doing a really good playthrough, you know, on harder difficulty with the status effects. So, like, actually enjoy the game. Hmm, yeah. It's a good game, is I guess, is I guess what I'm getting at here. So, um... Yeah, I still have not gotten around, gotten around to playing it. I... I kind of go back and forth where I'm like, oh, it'd be cool to like engage with this. It's got all the, a lot of things that are, are really neat and unique about it. And then it's like, well, but like, I can't let any of my kids watch it or they won't sleep at night. Right. Yeah. The Typhon are not like typical, like they are nightmare fuel in a way that say, you know, just the evil space Marines are not. You can shoot a bunch of those guys. That's not going to give kids any nightmares. Yeah. Well, like one of my my little girl can't watch uh, Voltron Legendary Defender because then she gets scared at night. So like, you know, there are varying tiers of, of allowance. And then like, you know, my oldest is also kind of nervous about stuff. So I don't think, yeah, I don't think the Typhon would go over very well in my house. All right. So keep the Typhon out of your house. That's good advice all around, really. And your eyes too, apparently. Right. Yeah. Don't jam them into your eyes, apparently. So this week, I'm hopefully going to team up with Chris Cesarano again on his A Steve podcast. And we might, Ooh, yes. we, we haven't, we haven't set a date, but we're probably going to do some streaming. Like he's going to do some streaming and I'm just going to be the, I'm going to be the guy in the chair. I'm going to be the, the, the guy sitting on his shoulder, second guessing everything he's doing. Oh, fun. I, yeah, I haven't done streaming in years. I really enjoyed it back in the day. You know, back when I was playing through Mass Effect and Andromeda. Those were some good streams. But, wow, it was time Except for the part where you can't talk and play at the same time. Right, right. It was like, looking back at it later, they'd be like this great two minutes of talking to people. And then 15 minutes of me just looking you know, apprehensively at the screen and ignoring chat. And that's probably not for the best, but you have somebody along and it works a lot better. Yeah. So we're probably going to do that in the coming weeks. Yeah. Look forward to that. That sounds fun. Do you know if you're going to be streaming on Twitch or YouTube or something else? I believe Chris streams on Twitch. There was actually... I was watching um, one of his VODs recently, and um, it was of the latest Resident Evil game. And um, that was interesting, seeing where Resident Evil is these days. It's interesting how different the, the different versions of Resident Evil are. They, every one of them is like, oh, this one's a crazy action adventure. Oh, no, now we're going back to horror. Oh, now we're doing camp comedy. <laughs> you know, it's like... <laughs> 
I guess you can't accuse this series of getting stuck in a rut. But I don't know if he's going to be playing that when, I, when I'm when i on the stream or not. I'm not sure what the plan is. More news yeah, to follow. Yeah, the turnover maybe... for that position, the resident evil position, is the turnover has got to be killer. In the show notes, you mentioned proc gen stuff in Blender. Tell me about that, Paul. All right, so this has been coming for a while. There was a little bit of something called geometry nodes in 2.92. Um, but the 2.93 release is like, it's got tons and tons of new features. It's basically a programming language for Blender that works like the shader editor. So it's, it's a node-based programming thing, basically. And so you can hook nodes together and tell it to do stuff. With shaders, you can tell it how to make the surface appear. And then with uh, geometry nodes, you can tell it what geometry to make, more or less interesting so it can it can rebuild itself kind of in real time yes it, it's sort yes, of exactly it's sort of, it sort of hands your code the origin of whatever this node is and maybe some of their information and you can figure out where to put the polygons around that origin yeah yeah so it's 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 very flexible um it's like the i don't know if you've messed around with the shader editor but it's similar or, or the compositing tool it uses the same node-based workflow uh, you can do you can do programming in python you've always been able to do that and it's still there scripting and stuff and that's still kind of what i prefer if you look at some of the examples you can be like whoa it's incredible what they can do but it, then when you look at the nodes it's so unwieldy that i'd almost rather just do it in python i don't know if there's some reason why it's node-based. I guess it's easier for people who aren't coders to get into, but um, one example that I thought was really interesting was the hex grid example. And there's a bunch of examples you can download from Blender, um, but I, I like the hex grid one because it's basically like a, a little grid, hex grid world where it's got, you know, little trees and houses and stuff and water and ships and the ocean and things. And it's all dynamically generated. So you can edit the underlying mesh or you can like change the way, change the noise function that generates it or anything about it and it'll update in real time and you can um one of the fun things i did is i put a, a shrink wrap on it and like put a mesh underneath it so that it added it and then i could move around this land mass underneath it and it would you know raise up the land and lower it again and is is very cool it's very cool to play with they've got procedural buildings and all kinds of fun stuff the splash screen for 2.93 was all made using these geometry nodes so uh i thought it was a really cool feature they added and, and maybe it'd be something fun for you to look at very cool i'm trying to look at it now and i'm like oh is that oh is this using the no oh wait that's a splash screen dang it <laughs> yeah it is <laughs> like using the nodes exactly oh that splash screen is this thing with the flowers yes yeah all those flowers are procedurally oh. generated oh of course yeah that makes the whole sense. scene is the that's... the background the the scissors all the pots the everything about it is procedurally generated the only thing he made were like the individual petals and then the whole thing is put together with this one gargantuan unwieldy node tree. It's not actually a good example of how you should do it, but it was kind of a proof of concept right. of like, hey, you could do this whole thing using just these these tools. Right, right. Sort of I'm proving what you could do with it if you were crazy. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's so cool. So you, you remember I was in a ho in the hospital about a month ago. Yeah, I was kind of Ian. debating as to whether to call you 13 window from now on, but it seems like Seamus works better. <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the things that really sucked is I did have a laptop there, but it was ancient. This is like an early aughts laptop. This thing is like 15 years old at least. And the battery... Is this your laptop or was it one that came with a hospital? It's... Oh, no, no, no. This was our laptop. The, the, the hospital gives you nothing except their TV. <laughs> Which is horrible. It has like three stations. It's just awful. Yeah, at least you don't uh, have to turn off your cell phone anymore. I remember back in the day, it'd be like, turn your cell right. phone off when you come into the hospital. Right, what the heck was up with that? <laughs> I think no they sense. wanted to not confuse people's ringtones with the sounds of the machine. Like when someone had right. a heart attack. I don't know. Well, um, so we brought my laptop, or the family laptop from home. But it was just so, you know, the battery died. You're, like the battery doesn't charge. The battery doesn't uh -huh. deliver. Oh, yes. So you have, see, it has to be plugged in and it's super heavy. 
and the keyboard sucks. And we were like, this is awful. I basically didn't, I, I used it to make that one post called sick day a month ago, but it was so yeah. awful trying to type on this broken keyboard and, and, um, or it wasn't sick day. Maybe I did that when I came home. Anyway, I did something while I was in the hospital, but it was, you know, it was 20 minutes of work under normal circumstances that took me the better part of an afternoon on this terrible laptop. Yeah, you, we like, you posted some comments in the in the diecast that Anna and I did, and I think that was what you said, like, I just posted this comment from my laptop and I want to kill myself or whatever. <laughs> Right. That's it. Yeah. So I left comments and that was evidently pushing the machine to its limits. So Heather and I were talking, we're like, oh, we need it. We don't want that to happen again. So we need a good backup laptop for if anybody gets bedridden or sick or in the hospital or has to go on a trip, they've got a good laptop. Mm -hmm. And we, and we got one and we got one. It was nice and cheap. Um, and I've been setting it up. It just came it, this is actually a secondhand used laptop. That's why it was so cheap. But it, you know, whoever Coming sold down to the it pawn to shop, us, yeah, they they wiped it first. So this was a <laughs> brand spanking fresh um, install of Windows 10, and and as I am, you know, just getting the machine ready for use, you know, I'm using Microsoft Edge, and so Microsoft Edge, yeah, and I search for, you know, obviously I want to download Google Chrome. So I search for it, and of course, Microsoft Edge uses Microsoft's Bing search engine. So Bing mm -hmm. is sense what I was doing. And it's like, hey, you shouldn't switch. Edge is the better browser. Don't switch. It was the most passive aggressive, like it made me angry. Like, how dare you mess with my search results? Just how I'm not like Google doesn't do that. Google will happily oh, let oh, you yes, search they do. for they do. Oh, yeah. Like, if you go check your Gmail on Edge, it'll be like, hey, uh, you want to download some uh, some trench coat Chrome? I got some right here. Interesting. I did not know that. Um, when I search for other browsers using, like, if I'm, you know, using Chrome and Google and I search for, like, Firefox, it doesn't give me any, it doesn't give me any trouble in the search results. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then when I downloaded the operating system was like, hey, hey, are you sure? I mean, this you got a pretty we got a pretty good thing going here. It <laughs> it's actually it's the if you remember the overly attached girlfriend meme from like ten or twelve years ago, the the running joke is this girlfriend that's super possessive, wants to know wants to constantly look at your phone and see who's texting you and know where you are at all times. That's what Microsoft that's what Microsoft felt like as I was searching for, you know, a real browser. What do you do? Who are you talking to? Who was that? You know, when I, I think we've talked about this before, but when I get a, a new install of Windows or whatever, I'll download Chrome, but I don't make it the default because then when Windows opens a website, it opens it in the default browser. And then my session on Chrome is unaffected. So I've got my pages up. Nothing, you know, tabs get open, all that stuff stays fine. And then when Windows opens up something, then it goes, or, you know, you click a link in a PDF or something, that opens up over an edge. And so then I can tell them apart real easy and I can just close the whole edge thing down on it, done with it and don't have to worry about it. Interesting. Never thought of that. Yeah, because that would technically work for me too, because I launch my browser, like from, you know, a shortcut and not by clicking links or whatever. So... Yeah, that would work. Interesting. And then Windows never bothers you about it because Edge is still the default browser. Right. It just assumes, oh, you're faithful to me. You would never cheat on me. You've made me the default <laughs> browser. Uh -huh. Yep. I'm going on a business trip. <laughs> Windows, you just stay home and bake cookies. Oh, no. There's the old joke about a guy who tells his wife he's going on a fishing trip and he tells her, to pack his silk pajamas oh, he's going on a fishing <laughs> trip with the guys and he tells her to yeah. pack his silk pajamas and he gets home and he's all angry and he's like you you didn't pack my silk pajamas where were they they weren't in my suitcase and she was like i put them in your tackle box oh <laughs> what do you say we do Smart. some mailbags yeah right
What do you say yeah, there? Along with the papers from my attorney. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> what do you say we do some mailbags? Yeah, they're piling up. We gotta, we gotta get some of these cranked out. Dear Diecast, in the last episode, <clears throat> wasn't the last episode anymore. We, we, we do not stay on top of these. Don't make assumptions that we're like timely and organized with your emails. Dear Diecast, in some past episode, you guys talked about Todd Howard and his public persona. That made me think of Bethesda as a whole. They're really unusual for a AAA studio. They can be incredibly ambitious in some areas and hopelessly outdated in others at the same time. There's also something unmistakably unique about their games, Bethesda's essence, if you will. So at in the end of the day, what are they trying to accomplish? What would a perfect modern Bethesda game be? The one that would catch up with their ambitions. I'm not talking about the games uh, about the days of Morrowind or Daggerfall, but today, what seems to be their ultimate goal? Cheers, Derek. So what is their ultimate goal? I think their ultimate goal is to sell everybody Skyrim again. Wouldn't that be nice? Just, again, just buy another version of Skyrim. So yeah, what are they trying to make these days? You know, I said, I flippantly said Skyrim, but I think there's a, I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think they, the success of Skyrim set their priorities to be oriented towards that kind of, they were like, this went over really well, we should do more of this. Now, are they still making The Elder Scrolls Online? Um, that is still being run, but it's not the same development team that does like, this isn't like when Bioware took half their, half their normal single player team and threw them in an MMO. This is like another, I don't know if it's another studio in name, but it's definitely another group of people. I believe mm -hmm. that that's that's my understanding based on how I've heard them talk about it. I mean, they've never showed me the org chart, but that's what I understand is like Elder Scrolls is kind of this area over here. And then our single player games is this team. So that's kind of interesting. But what are they trying to accomplish? Like the, that their core loop of kill a bunch of stuff, loot their corpses, drag it back to town, sell it, buy upgrades. That, they definitely love that. The, the, the trash picker, people call it trash picker games because you're just constantly opening containers and just hoovering up just hundreds and hundreds of pounds of garbage to drag back to town. And they've, they've sort of embraced that. That's been that's been central to their design since at least fallout three trash picker simulator that actually could work. right right and i mean that is the i don't want to say that's my favorite thing because it makes it sound like i love that but that is the thing that works for me the best of their games that and some kind of base build you know get resources take them back to your nest and make a better nest <laughs> so magpie Wait. simulator Dragon Horde Simulator. <laughs> if the dragon liked garbage. Myopic Dragon Horde Simulator. Right. So yeah, it'd be kind of funny. Leaning... It's like the the dragon has like some sort of thing where it like it thinks everything's made of gold, but it can't tell. It's just like, you know, sticks and leaves and stuff. <laughs> it's a funny idea. He just like jealously guards this giant horde of like broken two by fours and old benches and discarded clothes. Yeah. Little bobblehead figurines. <laughs> commemorative, smashed commemorative plates. <laughs> it's just the landfill dragon. Now, oh, they also make are... the Fallout series too, right? Or is that, am I getting yeah. confused? Yeah. Yeah, they, they have Elder Scrolls and the Fallout. And they seem to try and want to alternate between the two. They did Fallout 3. Well, they did like Morrowind, then Fallout 3. Then they did Skyrim. Then they did Fallout 4. Coming back around, the next game should be... Elder Scrolls They never again. made Oblivion. We don't talk about that one. Didn't exist. <laughs> oh, right. I forgot about Oblivion. But, um, that, uh, so the next one should be an Elder Scrolls game, but boy, the, the development time on this one has been long. When was Fallout 4? When did Fallout 4 come out? So I wonder if they're, they're having a meta strategy, which looks like their games where they like take a series and they make it cool and then they like turn it into trash and then they pick through the trash and get the good parts and then make the right. next game out of that one. Okay, so Fallout 4 came out in 2015. 
six so, years ago? Yeah. Did it make him any money? Oh, it was a huge hit. It, it was a huge hit. I mean, it was a it sold really well, but it sold well, it scored well, but people bitched about it. Which is kind of that's another weird thing. You know, Derek mentioned that Bethesda's a really unusual studio, and that's another thing, is that um people seem to complain a lot, but buy their stuff anyway. Well, Fallout 76 kind of bombed, right? That's right, and that's what the, that's that's why it's been so long. Is um, I was I was trying to think. I I was thinking, wait, it hasn't been six years since they the last thing they re released. That's the thing I was forgetting. Set Fallout seventy six. So it was like um, Fallout, and then when Skyrim was before that, right? Skyrim was twenty eleven, I believe. So they did. So then two it must have been like Fallout Skyrim, Fallout, Elder Scrolls Online, Fallout seventy six. Uh, they also had a mobile Elder Scrolls game, and I don't know if they handed that off to another team or if they did that in-house or how that worked. The Elder Scrolls clicker. Right. Connect three Elder Scrolls. <laughs> I, I, to answer Derek's question, I think their ambition is build stuff on top of that trash-picking gameplay loop. And I don't think they have a strong... Um, idea of what they want to do on top of that in terms of narrative. They know they want to do story stuff, but they don't seem to have a strong identity. And they have, oh, what's the diplomatic way of saying this? They have some writers that are okay. None of them are, they do not have any brilliant writers on their teams. But they have yeah. people that can, at the end of the day, bash out, you know, an acceptable quest that is like, all right, I did that quest. It was okay. Or, you know, they, um, Everybody liked the, I forget what it was called, but it was basically a ripoff of the movie The Hangover, where you, somebody gives you some booze, and then you wake up in a fountain in your underpants, and you have to trace your way back and figure out, like, what you did while you were blackout drunk. Right. Um, that was a good quest. But then there, there is somebody high, I, somebody high on the org chart in their writing team that is very, very, very bad and should not be writing. <laughs> and I'm not uh -huh. going to... Yep. People will know this guy's name. I'm not going to say his name on this show um, because I can't remember it. And also because that would be... Im that would be very impolite. But yeah, really bad. Maybe he's good at other things, but he should not be a writer. Mm. He really wants to be a writer, though. It's the only oh, thing so in his bad. life that gives him pleasure. <laughs> right? It's <laughs> these awful, awful, like, oh, that is so bad. It is so cringe. And they also tend to kind of go in on, what, derivative pop culture reference stuff, I guess? Yeah. I, I don't know. It's like the weird, yeah. weird, like, nods to real life, but that aren't well integrated into the world. And so they just kind of feel weird and out of place and, and like... Why are you referencing this thing? It's not even like a good reference. It's just like this weird, like, hey, hey, hey we we know the thing about pop culture, right? Aren't we cool? And it's like, no, guys, you can't do that. Don't do that. Right. Hey, guys, remember this meme from three years ago? <laughs> right. Because you, you have to, like, kids? you can't even have a modern, you can't have like a very relevant modern reference in a game, especially a game that has any legs on it. I'm like, oh, no, stop it. I guess they could have like a live service model where they just keep updating that one quest with all the latest memes. Oh my, that sounds like it would be pure. That would be meme hell. It would be like, okay, <laughs> this meme's only a year old and you've only <laughs> partly misunderstood it. It's where bad memes go to die. Right. Oh no. It's like all dogs go to heaven except all memes go to Bethesda games. Yeah, they want to make big, epic stories. They always want to make everything big and epic, but nobody wants... It's not that they're bad at world building. It's like nobody's even slightly interested in world building. Yeah, making it consistent, making it make sense, right. have it relevant to the gameplay and also relevant to the ethos of the world and the atmosphere. And it's just it's, it's nonsense from beginning to end. Right, it's like they don't even realize that's a thing you're supposed to do. <laughs> Man, they've got to hire Ian Hubert. That's what's got to happen. They got to hire somebody. 
All right, Paul, this next one is for you. Dear Paul, from previous diecast, Seamus slipped in that Deus Ex Invisible War traumatized him. Could you perhaps ask him what the experience was like without opening old wounds too much? With kind regards, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And although I'd love to do that, I'm afraid I can't. Next question. Uh, it, I'm not sure where the idea that it traumatized me came from. This is actually... I. I was not even much of a gamer when I played Deus Ex Invisible War. I've, I've gotten into this in the past, like between um, the Atari 2600 and Half-Life 2, I was just not playing video games. I was getting married, starting a career, busy with life, and I barely played games. And, you know, I'd played like one or two games a year. So when I got Invisible War, I was like, oh, boy, this isn't nearly as good as the other one, but I never stopped to think about why. What makes it not as good? So I was sort of just disappointed in it. I didn't know anything about it being a multi-platform release or about this being a console port because I'd never heard the term console port before. I had no idea. So I was just like, oh, that's they made a lot of decisions. I don't, why are the levels so small? That's weird. Did they not realize that huge sprawling levels was important? The, one of the core draws of the game? Right. And I just assumed, you know, I knew nothing about, you know, studio. I never paid attention to studios other than, you know, the obvious ones you could name like id Software or, or what or Epic. So, yeah, Invisible War is not great. But the reasons it is not great is because it was really fast dev cycle. And it was an early console port. And it had to fit in the ridiculously tiny memory of an Xbox, the original Xbox. Mm, and, yeah. And and that that just was the wrong game for that. So, yeah, not very good. And I think everybody just pretends that game doesn't exist because it just doesn't feel like Deus Ex. Dear Diecast, I've been having fun with an indie programming game called Dumbbots. It's a bit like a Zactronics game or one of those games where you control robots on a grid and have them fight each other. Except in this case, all of the scenarios are like something you'd see in a movie or action game. Your bots that are, start out so dumb, they sit there and do nothing, and you need to tell them how to steal the loot, survive the zombie apocalypse, kill everyone else in a deathmatch, and so on. Um, this one was not signed. Either that or I, or I bungled the copy and paste and I missed their signature. I am sorry, person, for missing your signature if you left one. But whoever you were, thank you for this question. I nearly bought this game. It looks so good. I love this idea so much. Um, but I'm in the middle of my prey right up. So I can't I can't play any other games or get distracted. But this is high on my list of things I'm going to do the moment I'm done writing about prey. I love this. I also I'm was interested to... in the game uh, until I saw the Steam page. I went to the Steam page and looked at it and it it's like a perspective camera over the shoulder kind of it's not even over the shoulder i'm not sure it, it looked like a weird presentation where it's like this third person but not tied to any particular character view it's 3d world but it's real low poly i don't know to me it looks like roblox yeah yeah it has a roblox feel to it um that's an interesting thing isaac's been into scripting in roblox roblox uses lua and um he kind of went crazy in the last few weeks and really, you know, taught himself Lua. He made the classic snake game within Lua, within Roblox. Oh, yeah. I was really yeah. proud of him. Yeah, I was really proud of him. Uh, the um, he's, There's a lot you can do with Roblox. I've never really given it a second look, but uh, yeah, very cool. I'm trying to get him to play this because I want to see what he, he does with it. Another game that had Lua as a scripting language way back in the day was uh, Cortex Command. And I messed around in that. That was that was really fun. What was the premise of that game? It's a pixel physics team team shooter thing. It's kind of it's kind of like um kind of like Starbound or or Terraria, but it was before oh, that. Oh, okay. Uh, and it's it's not big old chunky pixels, it's like actual tiny pixels. And so then they've got a whole bunch of they like break off into chunks of things. So it's got this whole fracture system built into it. It's got a really complicated engine, and it's, it's pretty fun. 
but the world size oh, is limited like, because of that. Sounds like Noita. Yeah, yeah, but again, Noita has a uh, well. No, Noita's got pixel physics. Yeah, it is similar. It is similar. It's more a sci-fi setting kind of thing uh, rather than fantasy. But um, yeah, yeah. If anyone's interested in an old game, I think it's still available on Steam. Cortex Command. All right. Uh, this next one is for you, Paul. No, actually, it's not. But you get to read it. Oh boy, where should I stop? Oh my, this is long. Dear Diecast, I'll just really, really fast. I open to work in film and a role that occasionally requires me to interface with old television and consoles and things like that, and I won't get into the intricacies of syncing televisions to camera, but my job is simply to make it work. I was given the task of putting an image on an old TV that only had RF input, and it wasn't a complex image, simply a green screen that had to be composited over by and post by the editors. One could bring a complex assortment of VCRs and scan converters and a laptop to do that, but a different idea came to mind. I had a 3DO collecting dust, and the 3DO is one of the few consoles that actually had a direct RF output. Not only that, but the 3DO had, is CD-based and not cartridge-based, meaning that there was a very good chance that I could actually homebrew an interactive program to do what I needed. As it turns out, 3DO development is exceedingly easy, and while development documentation is sparse, there's nonetheless a downloadable build environment for modern Windows installs and originally Mac OS 7 that, with a little environmental variable setup, can build into a Hello World disk image in less than 15 minutes. Plus, with a 3DO emulator core and a BIOS image easily acquired through RetroArch, you don't need to waste CDs to test your builds. Have you ever gotten involved in writing software for dead consoles? Are there any consoles you'd like to see revived? Any games that you'd want to see ported to an older console? Sincerely, Brad. As an aside, when you look at the Dreamcast, you'll notice that almost 20 years after it stopped production, there are still titles being released for it. And there's a link to that. Thank you, Brad. Very interesting. Um, like I said in the last question, I missed a lot of gaming history. I missed most of the 90s, especially in console world. Um, I did not pay attention to the industry or to studios or anything. I wasn't attached to any consoles, so I don't have, like, this really strong nostalgia for, like, the N64 or the Dreamcast or the 3DO or any of the, you know, the consoles of that time. Having said that, the PlayStation 2, which is where I got back into console, you know, that was, like, the first console I'd seen in 20 years. That was really something. And I wish that PlayStation's platforms were more open because the PlayStation 2 was so good and there were so many great games on it and it just felt like boy you could probably do some incredible stuff with that particular console mm. being just this magic uh spot in terms of processing power and capability you know when you're on the upgrade curve you know when you're on the not the upgrade curve when we're on the, the development curve, there were sweet spots looking back. Like, the original Xbox really limited memory for the time. And that was a big drawback for it. On the other hand, like, the PlayStation 2 was a really good one. There's um, also the factor of, like, how easy it is to emulate, which the original Nintendo and Nintendo... Right. Uh, a lot of those early games consoles had such a simple hardware setup that you could emulate it really well and so then you don't really need to have the console itself to play games for it you could just get a rom and right. emulate it right or you can develop on that emulated environment when you're all done burn a cd and put that on the real platform you want to you know mm -hmm. um at the other extreme I, it always feels like place i i played around with emulators way back like 10 years ago and I noticed one of the worst platforms to emulate at the time. I don't know where it's at now, but at the time, PlayStation 2, really bad. There was all these, <laughs> there were all these timing problems. I I don't remember exactly how it works, but here here's like the kind of thing I remember. Like, oh, there are two different processors working independently, and if you have the physical hardware, they just happen to line up naturally and deliver their stuff at the, at the proper rate to the main processor. But if you're working in an emulated environment, who knows when those, when those emulated things are going to be done. So you have all these weird timing problems. It was like um, multi-threaded back before we had tools to do proper multi-threading. Yeah, yeah, where they're using some sort of hardware timing thing where they like shared a clock, but they didn't use the same clock rate or something. 
right. And, oh, it would just work. You know, even if there was a bug in it, it would just work just because this one race condition would never happen because of this peculiar timing. But now right. you could imagine you could imagine a setup where you have I have no idea if this is how it worked, but you could imagine if like they had these two processors and each have their own clock and then there's a master that can like pause the clock on one or the other one so it just doesn't right. process anything until something else happens. And like you can't emulate that not easily anyway, because like how do you pause a process and you've got to have this complicated flagging system and like you said, it's all multi threaded nightmare stuff. Right. So it was like I don't remember the exact setup, but I remember there were timing problems and it would just result in all of these visual glitches, like sprites just rendering in front of crap or the edges of the screen would look weird and the time, the um, sound was always really dodgy. It was yeah. a nightmare to emulate where, yeah, if you want to emulate like Texas Instruments, TI-99 4A or an Atari 2600, it's totally straightforward. Or Super Nintendo. It was always just flawless, right. perfect emulation. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You can get, you can get frame perfect emulation every time, but it w on the PlayStation Two it was like almost analog. The the emulation was you're trying to emulate this unwieldy physical process. Yeah, it's too bad. Dear Diecast, have you ever tried out AI Dungeon? It's a procedurally generated text adventure game which came, comes up with some pretty wild and unexpected stuff from Donkey. Uh, that's interesting. I saw, uh, I, I have seen that come up in my recommendations on YouTube. Like, oh, so-and-so plays AI Dungeon. I was like, oh, that's interesting. I have not checked it out. Have you checked it out, Paul? I think I played a little bit of it some years ago, but I have not looked at it recently, no. Uh, it's too bad. I wish I'd done that before. But like I said, I normally I would you know check this out and then answer the question but I can't do that right now I'm in my playthrough of Prey and I've got to stay focused on that game it's real easy to get distracted from a game I'm writing a retrospective of and then it takes forever to get the retrospective written like you want to strike when it's all in your head you know you want to get it written while the game is in your head and you you remember all the things you love and all the mem moments that annoyed you, and so I've been I've been forcing myself to only play prey. So a lot of these questions of hey have you checked out so and so is going to be no until I get prey done. So I'm doing it right now, and this is kind of interesting. So it, it, oh, yeah? it gave me a tutorial thing, and uh, you know the, the noble kingdom of Larian is being attacked by Orcus raiders, and then it says just like. Type something, whatever you want to do. And, uh, and so you type something and then it generates some response of like, here's what happened. And then you can say like, okay, then what do you do? And you type out something else that you want to do. Or you can tell it to retry be like, no, no, that's not what happened. Try again. How interesting. Is this a Steam game or? It's play.aidungeon.io. Oh, it runs online. Yeah. Oh, neat. Yeah, yeah. So I just... I told, it's like the guard commander comes in to brief you. And I said, you greet, I, I said, greet the guard commander. And so it's like, you greet the guard commander. And then it gave me a thing of like, the orcs are moving fast, sir. Yes, I know. We have to, we have to get, you know, get on this situation. So I'm like, try again. And uh, so it's like, good morning, commander. Good morning, sir. The orcs raiders are moving fast. Everyone has to be on their game today. No room for error. Yes, sir. So I was like, <laughs> it's, it's got an idea of what it wants to do. But then it's like, okay, we can look at this from a different angle. <laughs> That's amazing. Huh. So, you know, I've been wondering what happens when we start hooking AIs up to running games for us. How long is it going to be before you... <laughs> so Go for it. Tell me. So I said, I said, sip my tea. And, and so it says, you sip your tea. And then, and then I say, apparently, we need to raise the drawbridge. Yes, sir. I'll get right on it. The guard commander leaves. You finish your tea. <laughs> This is not bad. It's not too bad. So how long will it take before we could hand this thing like a tile set for a classic like old 2D, like a Planescape Torment or a Diablo 2 tile set of a world and have it make a world and 
you know, make dialogue and have you interact with characters. We can't be oh. more than a couple years away from having something coherent come out of that. Just a few more papers. Greetings, fellow scholars. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. I think this is this is totally the future. This is going to be awesome. I like it. I like it a lot. I've been I've been hoping for this kind of um, this kind of thing for a number of years. I wrote a whole blog about like where we could be going with computers doing role playing stuff, and this is this is fascinating. I'm gonna have to play with this some more. It sounds fun. Maybe we'll get the awesome. kids to learn to write. Okay, the next one I'd kind of like to skip. It's talking about survive the hunt. That's again. Well, I'll tell the story of survive the hunt. It's um. You play Grand, it's played in Grand Theft Auto Online, and it's one person, it's an asymmetrical game where it's one person against everyone else. Your goal as the hunted is to just run out into the city and you get like a several minute head start. And your goal is to, I forget what your ultimate goal is, but you've got to accomplish it without anybody um, spotting you. You have to blend into the AI, which means, you know, just um, following the following the AI behavior in terms of driving or being a pedestrian, and uh, it's just fascinating because you've got all these players hunting you, and they're allowed to use they're they're allowed to try and kill you, and you're not supposed to fight back. You're just supposed to run. Like this is not a combat game, and this game mode is not recognized by Grand Theft Auto Online. This is entirely like people just made it up. They just like, there's no formal recognition within the game of like, who wins and what's the point of the game. I found it completely thrilling. I loved it. I watched them play this for oh so many, so many hours. And apparently the game has evolved. So this person sent in an email letting me know there's more of the series. I'm going to watch it. And I'll probably tell you what I think later. Thank you for telling me about that, Nick. Because I'd totally forgotten about this. Sweet. Yeah, we talked right, about so how it would be awesome if it was its own standalone game. And it hasn't happened yet, but it's got to happen sometime. Right. Oh, come on. Rockstar, just put that, make it official in the game. Because everybody has to be on the honor system. And it would be so much cooler if, if the game just recognized it and would if you have been, could gank if there was randos a ref, is that where we're going no no that it would behave as a proper referee for the game that would be great. yeah yeah uh, you just have to like agree to never um shoot anybody but it would be nice if it would just disable your guns so there wouldn't be that temptation and you wouldn't have accidentally shooting your gun because you pressed the wrong input like oh, i want to get in this car oops oh no i just shot somebody and now everybody knows i'm the the human player in this group of ai's like right right it'd be nice or, or have some ai's right. behave violently so that it, you have cover or whatever this is, there's a ton right. of things you could do if you had it official game mode right yeah it would be so much better but I'm going to read this next one, which is the last question, and then we will have cleared the die, the mailbag. Dear Diecast, today I learned that Stack Overflow is apparently worth $1.8 billion. I can't quite decide whether that's too little or too much. I've had mixed experiences with the site. What kind of experiences have you had there, John? Well, John, that's a stupid question. Market is duplicate. <laughs> uh-huh. Um, yeah, so that's really, somebody bought Stack Overflow for 1.8 billion. That is interesting. I, I, I saw that on Reddit. I saw people making jokes about it. I did not see the headline. I intuited this happened based on the jokes people were making about it. Ah, the crazy thing is that this huge repository of gathered wisdom for a a broad range is not just programming like there's all kinds of stuff like game tutorials and all kinds of stuff on there how do i get x thing running that that's a big part yeah. of it is like oh i can't get this thing running and somebody will come in oh yeah you go out to the terminal window and you type in this cryptic bullshit and it works <laughs> and also that was a stupid question marked as duplicate <laughs> yeah i mean like and and that's a problem the 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 marked as duplicate thing is a problem on every forum because it's basically just a big forum 
is a problem on every forum because you'll get some noob coming in who doesn't even know how to search. And they're just like, help, I'm trying to turn in my term paper and I need to know how to get the print function to work. And you're just like, oh, there's so many answers to this. And so there are so many answers to questions that are better stated than your question is, and the answers are better too. And so it's just like, why are you cluttering up this ecosystem with your pointless, poorly phrased nonsense? But on the other hand, like this guy is sleep deprived and he doesn't know how to search for stuff. He doesn't know the site. He, he just came here from Google or whatever, and or maybe Edge, and he doesn't have any idea what the protocols are. And so like, you have to give him some grace or he's never going to come back or he's never going to help anyone here. So it's like, it's this tension between wanting to make the space clean and well-organized and wanting to welcome people in who don't really know all the rules. Right, right. Um, And you do get people, some people are obnoxious about Marcus Duplicate. Like, I don't want to use a programming example, so I'm just going to use, like, imagine a real-world version of Stack Overflow where people ask anything. And so somebody would be like, help my garage door opener won't open the, you know, won't open. I'm trapped outside my house and can't get in. I keep hitting the button and the garage door won't open. And then somebody else, will, and then somebody will come along and say, oh, this is a duplicate of help. I accidentally left my keys in the house and I'm locked out. It's like, yeah, you're <laughs> locked out, but yeah. this is a different problem with a different solution. The answer to this, the answer that this person needs is change the battery in your garage door opener, where the other person needed, you know, look under the welcome mat for your backup key or call a locksmith. Right. Or, or maybe the power's out. Is the power out? You don't know. Right. Yeah. So these are, di these are similar problems, but they have different solutions. And some people are just so eager to mark everything as duplicate. No, there are no new questions. Nobody could possibly have a new question. <laughs> everything is a duplicate. We should not be answering any new questions ever. And it's very frustrating yeah. because I'll get there. And what I really hate is marked as duplicate. That, that's the worst thing. I search for a problem. Oh, look, there's a Stack Overflow describing the problem. I go there, and instead of getting an answer, I get marked as duplicate. And the so, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll click on what was the original question. And, yeah, it's something unrelated. If somebody ah. had answered this question with change the battery in your garage door opener, I would be, you know, I would be helped. But instead, it's like, look under the welcome mat for the key. And that doesn't solve my garage door opener problem. Yeah. Yeah, well, and, and the the frustrating thing about it is that as time goes on, the uh, marked as duplicate Nazis are more often right, right? They, they become over time correct more of the time because there are more questions right. that have been answered. And so on sure. the balance, like more things are going to be duplicates. But at the same time, you don't want to give them any ground because like, yes, Sometimes it's a duplicate. And in fact, maybe most of the time it's a duplicate, but you have to let people open new questions because like, <laughs> right. <laughs> otherwise, why do you have this site? Why don't you just freeze it and take it down? And it, it's clearly valuable because it's worth almost $2 billion. So what are they going to do to make money with this site for $2 billion? Are they just going to sell ads? Like, uh, does... Does Stack Overflow even have ads? Okay, I use an ad blocker, so I don't know. And But is there like, are there ads on Stack Overflow? Now they can do what they did with Minecraft. They sold it for about the same amount. I don't, what did they do with Minecraft? Sell servers. All right. Sell Stack they, Overflow They probably servers. have it. Yeah, have, a, have like a dedicated Stack Overflow thing for your application or whatever. And like you can dial into your own private Stack Overflow that's got a curated list of all the questions that pertain to your business or your in development environment or whatever, and, uh, you know, make it a service. And then when somebody, uh, you can make a script, like this could be in PHP or just JavaScript, really, just allow people to submit new questions and it will automatically, it will take the new question, 
automatically mark it as duplicate and then link to a <laughs> random past question. <laughs> yeah. I thought I thought you were going to go like you could make this complicated, convoluted way of like getting to your your special version of Stack Overflow, and then you could have people pay to submit questions on how to get that working. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Well, you. Oh, that's tricky. Yeah, you're trying to get. I'm trying to get a uh, Stack Overflow running on my server. Where do I put questions on how to get that running? Well, you got to buy your support contract, pay your support contract fee for the month. I don't know. I mean, Stack Overflow is incredibly, it is, it is the double-edged sword of the programming world. You, you can't live without it. It has just saved my butt so many times. But at the same time, it can also be infuriating. And like you said, it is solving a very hard problem. There are going to be there are going to be many stupid questions, but at, but then there's a tendency to say that everything is a stupid question, <laughs> and sometimes that stupid question is not as stupid as it seems on the surface. Hmm. Yeah. There's a bunch of Blender stuff on Stack Overflow. Interesting. I've used that, it for Blender more than once. That's got to be weird because Blender has changed so much. Like to answer a question with modern blender that that's a that's another dangerous area where oh how do i do this and emar you know somebody will say oh that's a duplicate Unity that was answered development, back in, right right Th that was answered back in 2013 and it's like yeah that's for the 2013 version of this that answer is no longer useful Modern Blender or Modern Unity is completely different. That's not even the same programming language now. Yeah, I have recognized, I have seen stuff like that for Unity where it's like, this is duplicate. And it's like, yes, it's a duplicate question, but the entire underlying system is changed. So there's a new answer. What you should do is destroy yeah. the old question because it's just poisoning the search results. Well, really, the, the question needs to include the version of Unity, right? Like... How do I do X in Unity 14.3 yeah. or whatever? Yeah, that, that would actually be much better. You're right. Because that would help people that are searching to solve this problem in 2032. And they don't want my <laughs> stupid 2021 answer. Because it's like, that doesn't work anymore. Yeah. The Blender stuff that I've run across has been almost always a version. So I search for like, how do I X in Blender... 2.81 or whatever and then you get results that are pretty decent and sometimes it'll be like a, a weird version one where it's just like oh this is such a good answer and people loved it so much it's for the wrong version but you'll love it too and it's like no 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 stack overflow come on it, this all of these things are important i didn't put any of these in here on accident i've searched for things for answers on blend or about blender but my questions are always so basic i never wind up on stack overflow in fact, you can you could sort of tell what level you're operating at. Like you do a search, and if you're a beginner, you're gonna wind up with a, "Hey, welcome to my YouTube video. Here's how to get started in this thing." <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. But then once you get past all of the tutorial, like every time I'm like, "Wait, how do I select? B I want to resize multiple objects." I'm not going to get that on Stack Overflow. I'm going to get that in a bunch of tutorials. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and yeah. the the rise of the YouTube tutorial instead of just like a oh. short piece of text is so frustrating. But that's a separate issue. Right. I and you you gotta you gotta word your question carefully because there are a lot of good Blender tutorials out there that are just text-based. It's like, oh, here's what you do. And you do have to read through a bunch of, it's like, oh, here's your first 10 minutes in Blender. And you've got to go to like minute seven to find what you're trying to learn, right? But it's there and it's in text. Yeah, yeah the, the Blender documentation is pretty good. Um, right. But the, the kind of stuff that I ended up with on Stack Overflow for was like, how do I write a Python script to unlink the animation data from two duplicated objects or something like that? Right, like this super esoteric stuff that, yeah, is not where is the button to do X kind of question. Once you've graduated beyond that, then you're going to start winding up at Stack Overflow. It's sort of fascinating. You can see that thresh. You can see that threshold. I had the same thing in Unity. 
My first couple days of Unity would just land me at nothing but tutorials. And then once you... Right. How do I set up you... a shader? How do I right. get my game to change the frame rate or whatever? How do I set the background color? And then like you get you get over that threshold. And that's a frustrating threshold because there's a lot there. But once you get over like the newbie questions of where do I find this in the interface and you mm. get into the esoteric stuff, then you start winding up on Stack Overflow. But I wonder if the answers to those simple questions are on Stack. You know, how do I set the background color? I wonder if somewhere on Stack Overflow, there's a, somebody answers that question. You know, how do I set the background color in Blender or whatever? And it's there on Stack Overflow, but it's just you never see it because there are 10,000 tutorials on YouTube that tell you that also. And they wind up, you know, overwhelming it in the search results. Well, this also tells our audience something about both of our query paths, which is that we just type it into Google and like right. let Google sort all that out. If we were actually going to Stack Overflow, we would know if those things were on there. But like Stack Overflow is only as useful as Google thinks it is. That's true. I've never searched for anything on Stack Overflow directly. I've always gone there through Google. That actually, like, why haven't I? That's probably a way better way of, of looking for, especially when you're looking for something <laughs> very specific. Like, that's something I should do. That's something I haven't done in the past, but I should do. Well, I think we all learned something today. Right. We learned that this was a stupid question, and it's marked as duplicate. <laughs> All right, that's it. For the first time in several months, we have cleared the mailbag. Woo! Kind of. Thank I mean, there's still that one that we put off till next week. All right. Well, whatever. Close enough. Um, thanks so much to everybody who sent in questions. If you've got a question for the show, our email is diecast at SeamusYoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Stupid ending. Marked as duplicate.